Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Anderson. I am the Sustainable Communities Manager for the IPM Institute of North America. We are an environmental nonprofit based out of Madison, Wisconsin, and our mission is to advance sustainability in our culture and communities through market mechanisms based in integrated pest management. We're very excited to have a presentation from Dr. Doug Richmond from Purdue University titled Sustainable Management of Turf Grass Insects. Um, before we introduce Dr. Richmond, I just have a couple of housekeeping uh, information to go through about Green Shield Week, uh, Midwest Grows Green, some of our sponsors, and some upcoming uh, sessions uh, that are of interest for everybody. So starting off, um, this, there's two initiatives that have, are hosting this specific webinar, Green Shield Certified, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, and Midwest Grows Green, which I've been involved with since its beginning in 2015. And our mission at Midwest Grows Green is to educate and empower citizens to take sustainable landscaping action that reduces harmful runoff into our waterways, protects the health of our most vulnerable citizens, and reduces negative impacts of pesticides on non-target species such as pollinators. We have an ambitious goal or vision uh, for Midwest Grows Green, and that is to make all public and private parks, playing fields, and outdoor landscapes in the Midwest organic by 2030. It is ambitious, but we think we can get there by setting specific metrics and targets for our three programs that identify sustainable landscaping through Green Shield Certified for Landscapes, that teach sustainable landscaping through our Lawn and Land Forum, and finally, that implement sustainable landscaping through our Midwest Grows Green Technical Assistance Program. So we have three programs, and none of these programs and our work would be possible without our supporters and our sponsors and our funders. Uh, this session is uh, largely funded by the North Central IPM Center. So it's supported by the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, Crop Protection, and Pest Management Pro Program through the NCIPM. The NCIPM has funded our Lawn and Land Forum working group since its start in 2015. And our working group has been able to host two to three webinars each year and one in-person workshop covering sustainable landscaping practices and bring in experts like Dr. Doug Richmond to talk about sustainable pest control, but also compost top dressing, um, organic fertilization, um, overseeding, and a number of other concepts. So thank you to the NCIPM for making us, for allowing us to do these webinars. They also support our school IPM working group um, and our TIC IPM working group. So if you want to learn more information about that, please do contact me. We also have another major sponsor for this week and for Green Shield Certified and Midwest Grows Green, and that is Earthworks Turf. Um, Earthworks Turf has worked with our technical assistance program to help a number of parks and green spaces transition away from synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. They have organic-based um, fertilizers, mainly made from chicken uh, manure. So um, if you want to learn a little bit more about them, please do visit their website. And Midwest Grows Green actually has a upcoming uh, podcast with them where we talk about Green Shield Certified for Landscapes. And one of our GSC for Landscapes companies, Alec McLennan from Good Nature Organic Lawn Care, joined us for that podcast. So that should be coming out uh, during Earth Week. I also want to recognize two other sponsors. Uh, first, Tectera Environmental. They are a organic pesticide as well as an organic fertilizer distributor um, out in the East Coast. Barry Draycott presented on Monday, and we have a recording of that session of uh, the number of products that they are able to distribute. And also, uh, Green Shield Certified for Landscapes companies are offered a 15% discount. Uh, to Tectera Environmental and their products. And then finally, we have Natural Garden Natives, uh, which is a native plant distributor out in the Midwest, owned by Midwest Ground Covers. So they distribute native plants to many different companies as well as uh, individuals. And they have been a supporter of Green Shield Certified for Landscapes basically for since its beginning. So we're very happy that they're able to sponsor um, us. 
So I've mentioned Green Shield certified a number of times. This is a Green Shield certified week webinar, um, the third of four. Um, so we are winding down, but we do have one more webinar next week, and that is proposed EPA restrictions on rodenticides. Um, this is a very exciting webinar for us. Uh, there have been proposed restrictions on all second generation rodenticides, so putting those as restricted use. And so we have Hardy Kern from the American Bird Conservancy that will talk about the motivations behind um, these restrictions, as well as the ins and outs of uh, the proposed restrictions. So uh, he can keep you up to date on what those restrictions are. And then we have Dr. Bobby Corrigan, who is known as kind of the foremost expert in urban rodentology, um, and he will talk about um, how pest control operators can comply uh, with, with these restrictions through exclusion as well as some other uh, practices. So we're very excited to have that uh, presentation next Thursday at 2 p.m. If you deal with rodenticides at all or rodent control, we highly encourage you to attend this session because um, it'll be very informative. Um, for this session specifically, and as well as our other sessions, they are approved for continuing education units for the states of Florida, Kansas, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. Um, if you want to get your credits, please, after this session, send an email to Lorelei. Her contact information is on this slide, and her contact information is also in the chat section. Um, so uh, please email her after this entire session to get your continuing education units. Um, just want to go through the objective of our, our webinars, and basically it's to provide attendees with the tools to implement sustainable landscaping and ultimately achieve our Green Shield Certified for Landscape standards, which we believe are the first sustainable landscaping certification standards in the U.S., we introduced them last year, um, and you can learn more about those standards at bit.ly slash GSC in caps and landscapes in uncaps. We do have three pilot companies that have passed our standards, and I just want to take some time to congratulate them. I mentioned Good Nature Organic Lawn Care. They service uh, in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania now. Uh, mainly just lawn care services. So they are one of our first pilot companies. We have Dig Right In Landscaping, who does organic lawn care out in the western suburbs of Chicago, but also does um, sustainable landscape design and a lot of flood uh, control help uh, for individual landscapes. And then finally, we have Natural Communities Native Plants, which is a native plant distributor, but also consults on natural area management and Nick Fuller, the owner of Natural Communities, has presented multiple times for our Lawn and Land Forum. So we uh, want to congratulate all these companies for passing our certification process, uh, which required them to pass a thorough on-site evaluation where they need to meet our minimum requirements, such as not applying any products um, that are carcinogenic, neurotoxic, as well as endocrine disruptors and are harmful to pollinators, fish, and aquatic wildlife. And then they need to score 80% or above on our scored practices, which are advanced sustainable landscaping practices, such as do you have compost top dressing program? Uh, do you have a proper overseeding program? Do you use native plants? And so on. Uh, they get an interim report with recommendations to achieve our standards and then a final report once they have achieved our standards then we offer regular marketing like a press release that we just did on monday and an annual renewal uh to make sure that they're complying and continuing to avoid products that uh go against our standards and then they need to pass an on-site evaluation every three years to retain their certification so if you're interested in uh, applying for these standards, please contact myself, Ryan Anderson at randerson at ipminstitute.org to schedule your on-site evaluation. All right, that is, uh, that's all the housekeeping that I need to get done. 
And now I would like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Doug Richmond. We're very excited to have Dr. Richmond. Um, we've had a lot of sessions uh, through the Lawn and Land Forum, and one of the topics that came up a lot was uh, sustainable management or organic management or natural management of insect pests, specifically grubs, but a couple other insect pests have come up. And so uh, Dr. Richmond, as is going to present his approach that integrates cultural, biological, and low impact chemical tools. And so I will turn uh, the screen over to you, Dr. Richmond. All right. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the nice introduction. I uh, also want to thank the IPM Institute for uh, inviting me to give this webinar today. Um, so, Ryan, can you see my screen okay? We cannot yet. I have you shared on. Hold on. I'm Just still seeing my... your screen, Ryan. Yeah, I can stop my share. So. All right, how's that looking? Lorelai, can you try making him the host? Maybe that will work. Yeah. All right. All right. So are we are we set on that side? Can you see my my slides? Uh you you still need to press the share screen. Oh boy. Let's see here. No. Wow. I don't know why I'm having issues with this, Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> just um, for the audience, we did uh, we did test it out before, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it did I, work. <laughs> I have no command and control from Zoom here. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you want to send your slides to me, and I'll share on my screen? Oh boy, it's going to be a difficult. Um, What's going on Hold on. Okay. I'm going to exit and re-enter, Ryan. I think that's oh, the other um, Then can you just make Lorelai the host? Oh, yes. Please. Yeah, because if you exit, then it'll... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we apologize. Well, all right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> wow. Sorry about that, folks. You'd think that I've never done this before. <laughs> but I have. Um, all right. So thanks for the introduction. I, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about sustainable management of turf insects. I'm framing this as from ecological framework to implementation. So let me give you a quick overview of my presentation. Um, I'm going to start by talking about that ecological framework, right? All of the components here, soil, grasses, pests, beneficials, and a little bit about insecticides. And it's important to take all of these into context because those, all of those elements are what we rely on to formulate an effective integrated pest management strategy.
So after I talk about that framework, I want to move on to what I call our niche-based monitoring and management. And this is important because it tells us who is where and why they are there. All right, I'm talking about, when I say who, I mean what insects. And that has important implications for both monitoring and detection, as well as the management uh, programs that we put in place. I'll spend some time specifically talking about host plant resistance because it's really the, the foundation, in my opinion, for sustainable insect management in turf. I'll focus on one particular group of, of resistant plants and that's endophyte enhanced grasses. Um, and then I'll move on to talk about some other forms of resistance, uh, insect resistance in particular that are available in other species and particular cultivars. I also, <coughs> excuse me, wanna spend a little time talking about biological and biorational controls, specifically insect parasitic nematodes, because I think these are some, some tools that we can use that are actually scientifically proven to be effective, right? There's lots of data out there on these, but there are caveats in terms of how we use them. I will focus then on some of our newer microbial products, especially in the realm of white grub control. And then I'll finish with a little bit about biorational and low impact insecticides in general. And I'll conclude with some, a few remarks and uh, open it up to a question and answers. All right, so this ecological framework, when we think about soils, that's the foundation for growing healthy plants, right? It's all about the soil. And the soil is composed of, you know, it's gonna produce healthy plants basically that resist and recover more quickly from any insect pest damage. That includes microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi, it includes macroorganisms, lots of soil arthropods, earthworms, even vertebrates. It also includes other organic components. Think about plant wastes, uh, plant, uh, uh, old plant material, decaying plant material, as well as the, uh, the byproducts or excrement from, from some of these other organisms. And then lastly, soil complodes, uh, includes this mineral component. We have to have all of those components in place in a healthy soil in order to build healthy structure to that soil. And that structure really depends on the formation of these stable soil aggregates, right? These aggregates are complex. They're made up of all these different pieces, including live and mineral uh, components. But basically what they do is they regulate carbon and nitrogen mineralization, right? And that's important because that means that it's, it's regulating the availability of nutrients to the plants. Nutrients are made available to plants in a slow and steady rate that matches their growth. It also promotes air and water infiltration, which of course is important because plants roots have to access plenty of air and water to grow uh, to uh, be able to provide the top part of the plant with the nutrition it needs to grow. And it allows the plant to allocate its resources as needed instead of putting a bunch of extra nitrogen fertility toward top growth. It allows the plant to allocate those, those resources to, toward growth, defense, and reproduction on an as needed basis. So like all ecosystems, turf grass systems have a trophic structure. And what I mean by trophic structure is who eats who, right? All of these organisms are interacting and that helps regulate insect populations. So in that trophic structure, we have our producers. These are the plants, right? They're photosynthesizing, they're making their own energy. We also have primary consumers, right? These are the things that feed on plants. This is the trophic level where all of our insect pests reside. Above that then we have our secondary consumers. Think of them as predators, parasites, and pathogens that feed on or attack the primary consumers in our system. 
So these are the things that help regulate populations of our pests. So there are these, these interactions between all of these aspects of this system. And we can think about it as top-down regulation, that is where our consumers um, regulate our, our key pests, or bottom-up, and that is where the plant has an impact on the pest. Insecticides fit in this in a, from either a top-down or bottom-up perspective. So let me, go, let me talk about that just for a second. Of course, the targets of insecticides are the insect pests. But we know for sure that some of our broader spectrum contact insecticides in particular can indirectly affect our beneficial insects that would otherwise be helping us regulate pest populations. Some of our newer classes of insecticides also are taken up by the plant, right? They may not have a lot of direct contact activity, but they are taken up by the plant and put out through that plant uh, uh, tissue, right? So the roots take the material up and the plant arms itself with that insecticide as a protectant. The actual action of these insecticides then depends on the insecticide class, the formulation, and some of its other properties. For, for instance, water solubility and transportability within plant tissues. So with that, sort of ecosystem framework in place, that's where we overlay this IPM strategy. IPM is basically, in my definition, it's a framework that integrates cultural, biological, and chemical controls, but it does so by relying on proper identification of the pest, monitoring, and evaluation of any actions that we take. So after we take steps to manage a pest, it's always a good idea to go back through and evaluate how successful were we? Do, are, there, are there changes that we may need to make or consider for using that product again? But to be sustainable, I think it's safe to say that IPM has to be aligned with the stakeholders' attitudes and expectations. All right. So I have these three axes that I talk about a lot when I'm teaching students. You know, the first one being people who are ranged from being risk averse, right? They're very cautious. They, they, they aren't willing to accept any kind of damage to those that are, well, relatively damage tolerant. They accept that some damage is gonna occur and that they can repair that damage. There also another, there's also this other axis of folks that are relatively environmentally conscious, right? They're careful about the things that they do in their lawns and landscapes, and they wanna make sure that they're not doing anything that's detrimental to the larger ecosystem. The other end of that spectrum then is that folks that are completely indifferent to this, they may not even be aware about the possible side effects or non-target effects of the things that they're doing. And then, then this last axis is folks that are pretty well informed ranging clear over to the other side that are people that are really actually not very well informed and aren't making informed decisions. Now, so that's the framework that we're implementing IPM in. So when we talk about insects in particular, I find it useful to think about this, how we organize insects and how that, or the way we organize them dictates the way we manage them. So insects can be categorized based on either on taxonomy or on niche, right? Taxonomy organizes insects based on their evolutionary relationships. So a beetle is a beetle, right? They're holometabolous insects, so they're closely related to ants, butterflies, flies, those sorts of things, right? It's useful for identification. But niche organizes insects based on where they live and feed. And I find this to be a much more useful way to organize insects when we're trying to develop ways to manage them. So we have insects that feed above ground on the green leafy portions of the plant. And we have insects that feed below ground in the soil and thatch layer. 
So from a management perspective and from a sampling perspective, where these insects reside and what they feed on has, is going to help inform how we monitor for them and how we use the products that we have available to us to manage them, the products and tactics both. So just briefly here, I think of our above ground insects as insects that chew on or extract fluids from leaves and stems, right? They may reside in the soil or thatch during part of their lives, but the damage that they cause results from them feeding on above ground plant tissues. These are insects such as caterpillars, uh, that would include cutworms, sod webworms, and army worms but it also includes this other group of insects, chinch bugs, right? Which are actually not chewers, but they, they actually withdraw fluid from the plants. So in terms of above ground insects, we really have these two main groups. There are others that vary regionally, but these two main groups are going to encompass 90% of our above ground insects. Below ground insects are a little bit different question, but again, it's a, it's a fairly small number of groups of insects. So these are the insects that chew on plant crowns and roots below the soil surface. They may reside at the surface during part of their lives, but the damage that they cause results from them feeding below ground. These would include insects like our billbug complex, of which there are several species, and of course, are white grubs, of which there are again several species. So where these insects reside and, and where they cause damage in the turf environment is going to dictate how we monitor for them and detect them in order to make some sort of a decision of whether or not we need to implement a management strategy. It requires looking at the right place at the right time and using the right tactics to do so. So for surface insects, we typically think of a couple of different approaches. The first is what I call a hands and knees approach, right? Getting down there and closely examining what's going on at the margin of damaged areas, pulling back the turf canopy, looking at the thatch, right? Looking for insect activity, just we're using the naked eye and some finger work. But we can also use some other tools such as soap flushing, right? We can flush these insects from the, from the, the turf canopy using a soapy water solution. Of course, insects don't particularly like that. So they'll try to avoid it by wriggling their way out of the soapy, soapy slush. On the soil insect side then, there's really only one way for us to actually get a glimpse at what's going on in this soil, and that is to dig, right, to soil sample. You can do this a number of ways. Here I have a photo of someone using a golf course cup cutter. That's a great tool for this, but you can also use a shovel or a sod knife to cut a wedge in the turf and excavate that soil and carefully look through it to see if you can find something like white grubs or billbug larvae. So once we've figured out if we have an insect problem and we understand how to monitor for them, there are a few basic things or tactics we can put in place to help reduce the likelihood of insects becoming a problem in the first place. And really the foundation for this lot relies on host plant resistance. Host plant resistance basically is the, the selection of species and cultivars that resist insects damage in the first place. And they can do this through a, several different modalities, including uh, having a direct impact or being unpalatable to the insect, or just being able to tolerate the damage of an insect at higher population densities. So I wanna mention this one particular group of, of uh, host plants that are resistant, and these are endophyte enhanced turf grasses. These turf grasses have formed a mutualistic symbiosis with these fungi that provide defensive compounds that, to the plant that deter insect feeding or outright poison the insect. 
You could find these endophytes in association with you know, rye grasses, tall fescues, and fine fescues, such as hard fescue, chewings fescue, and uh, creeping red fescue. The thing with these endophytes though, is that they're really only active against above ground insects. And the reason is that these endophytic fungi are present only in the green leafy tissues. So the toxins that they provide to the plant really reside above ground. They're concentrated above ground. So they're gonna provide a, actually very effective protection against a whole suite of above ground feeding insects from caterpillars, to uh, chitch bugs and even bill bug adults. <clears throat> it's important to, to mention here that our cultural decisions also can influence the expression of that resistance. So for instance, just in choosing different cultivars of turf grass, here I have a, several different cultivars of tall fescue. The first thing that we, we noticed uh, when we were looking at these plants was that the endophyte infection level, the percentage of plants that are actually infected with the endophyte varies depending on the cultivar of grass we select. So we could range from very high endophyte infection rates in, in tall fescue cultivars such as Second Millennium and Da Vinci to moderate, more moderate or lower rates in Kentucky 31 and plantation. So that's the first cultural uh, decision that influences the expression of resistance. On top of that, nitrogen fertility can also influence the expression of resistance. So one of the major protective compounds that, that uh, these endophytes provide to the plant are ergot alkaloids. And we can see that if we, if we fertilize at a high rate versus a low rate, we can influence the production of those ergot alkaloids. Obviously, those endophytes are siphoning off a small amount of those resources that are available to the plants. And if they have more, they have the luxury of having access to more of those resources, then they go ahead and they produce higher levels of these defensive alkaloids. Then lastly, we found that cutting height can also influence the expression of resistance. So in this case, I've got black cutworm survival uh, in across four different cultivars of tall fescue that were maintained at different cutting heights. And you can see that we had lower survival of black cutworm at a higher cutting height. And the reason we think this is going on, and that's not, of course, across all of these, there is some interaction there, especially with Kentucky 31, it seems to be flipped a little bit. But generally speaking, there's this trend for more alkaloids to concentrate in the above ground tissues of larger plants, right? We're not cutting the tips of those grass blades off so short and not forcing the plant to use all of its or the more, more of its resources to regenerate that growth. Now, great. I mean, we have these resistant plants, but my lawn is say Kentucky bluegrass or some other species of grass that, that, that doesn't have these endophytes. Well, it's easy to incorporate these endophytic plants into existing stands of turf grass simply through overseeding, right? We did a study, so, uh, well, it's been over a decade or two ago now uh, where we tried this and it worked really quite well. Um, we introduced uh, perennial ryegrass into existing stands of Kentucky bluegrass and found that over time, the, the, that stand became uh, composed of a greater proportion of those endophytic plants. And not surprisingly, when we looked at those, those plots, um, we saw higher turf quality in those stands directly related to their resistance to one group of insects, the bill bugs, right? So we had this bill bug infested area that we overseeded into, and you can actually see the outline of those plots that we overseeded and how much less damage there is in those plots compared to the outside areas where they just, uh, where we just had Kentucky bluegrass growing. So it's an effective cultural strategy. One more quick aside on this. Um, we used to do, uh, when I was at Ohio State, we used to do some research uh, with chinch bugs and we maintained what I called a, 
our chinch bug ranch. And it was an area that we planted to uh, uh, find fescue. We grew it in the full sun and we maintained chinch bug populations in there. And occasionally they would just absolutely level that stand of grass. And one day I was out there and I noticed that amidst all of these you know, brown turf grass plants, there was this really perfectly healthy looking clump of perennial ryegrass. And sure enough, when I took it back to the lab, it was infected with the endophytes. I, could, I looked at it microscopically. So this is a pretty sharp contrast and it shows you how effective these endophytic varieties can be at staving off damage from insects, especially something like chinch bug. Now, there are other forms of host plant resistance that I mentioned earlier, such as just tolerance to pest feeding. So tall fescues in particular have this deep fibrous root system that tends to be less susceptible to damage by white grubs. You can see in this diagram, the roots of tall fescue are typically much deeper than something say like a, like a Kentucky bluegrass. So it takes higher population densities of the white grubs to actually damage those plants. It also happens that tall fescues in this case are actually more drought and heat tolerant. So again, it's an added benefit. The insect damage or the insect resistance is there, but these grasses just persist better under less, uh, uh, less sort of amenable conditions. Um, we do have some Kentucky bluegrass varieties that are resistant to one of our major groups of, of insect pests, the billbugs. Um, you know, and I, here's a list of them. I'm not going to name them all, but these have been scientifically proven, right? We've, we've, we've got the data to, to demonstrate that these, in, these varieties of Kentucky bluegrass hold up better under billbug pressure. On the warm season side, we also have some Bermuda grasses that are resistant to hunting billbug and some zoysia grasses that are resistant to that insect. Um, in terms of zoysia matrella, we have diamonds and zorro, and, and in terms of uh, zoysia japonica, Anzo and El Toro are pretty resistant to bluegrass or to uh, hunting billbuck. Now I wanna point you to a resource here, the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program. Uh, these, these this program works in cooperation with university researchers across the country and seed suppliers across the country who to evaluate these turf grasses on a region by region or state by state basis. And they collect all these data collected from all these field trials and they look at turf grass quality, color, density, resistance to diseases, insects, and tolerance to heat, cold, and drought. Also traffic, if, that's a, if it's a turf grass that's in a, in a high traffic area. Every year, it's the, the, the NTEP organization summarizes these data and makes them available on their website. So if you do have, you find yourself in a, in a position where you're able to renovate the, a turf grass area or a lawn, Look at the list that, turf, that NTEP provides. You can really get some really important data to help you make decisions on what selection of turf grass species and cultivars are right for your area and the kinds of strengths and weaknesses that those, those cultivars have. All right, so host plant resistance forms the foundation for insect pest management, sustainable insect pest management. But we also have a suite of biological and biorational tools that are available to us. The first one that comes to mind and the one that, I, that I've done a fair amount of research on and have seen uh, some really interesting and promising results from are these insect parasitic nematodes, right? These are microscopic roundworms that infect and kill insects. They don't hurt plants. They're not plant parasites. They are specifically going out there and targeting insects as their hosts. 
there are two main species that we typically see used in turf. The first one, and pardon me while I pronounce the scientific names, it's Heterorhabditis bacteriophora. This is a cruiser nematode. That's the strategy it uses to find its hosts. It actively seeks out these hosts by cruising through the soil and finding that host. So Heterorhabditis bacteriophora is a really effective uh, nematode against soil insects like white grubs and billbugs, billbug larvae that is. Another species is Steinernema carpocapsi. This, this nematode uses a different foraging approach. It's what we call an ambusher. So it uses the sit and wait strategy. So it sits near the surface of the soil and it waits for an active insect to pass by. So it's most effective against surface uh, dwelling insects like caterpillars, chinch bugs, and the like. These, in, these nematodes have an interesting life strategy. So if you start, let's start up here in the, in this corner, my pointer out. All right, they start out as these infective juveniles, we call them IJs in the soil. These juveniles are the ones that actually attack and kill the insect. So they enter the insect through natural openings or directly, sometimes directly through the cuticle. <clears throat> Once they get inside the insect, then they release a symbiotic micro, a bacteria that actually kills the insect, right? So that bacteria attacks the, the organ systems of the insect and it overwhelms the insect's immune response within about 48 hours. Then as that disease, really that septicemia progresses, it sort of turns the inside of that insect into a slurry, which is a food source for the nematodes. So the, the nematodes feed on that slurry of, of nutrients and bacteria and go through a couple of generations. And once they've depleted the resources of that, resources of that insect, they actually produce an, another generation of infected juveniles that leave that cadaver and go in search for uh, another host to infect. So you can see where once you've made, the, made an application or once you've introduced these nematodes into a turf grass system, there is the possibility or the potential for them to persist over time, right? They could keep seeking out new hosts, keep infecting them and turning that life cycle as long as there are hosts available for them to infect. Now, with any as with any biological control, there are some important do's and don'ts that I want to mention here. Let's start first with the do's, right? When you get a shipment, when you purchase insect, insect parasitic nematodes, put them in the refrigerator once you get them. And you put leave them in there until you use them. And use them as soon as possible after you receive them. You know. The health and viability of those nematodes is not going to last forever. So the quicker you use them and the, and the uh, sort of more safer conditions that you, uh, that you store them under means that you're likely to have effective product when you actually make the application to the lawn. You definitely also want to check product viability. So usually these nematodes will come in a sort of a freeze dried formulation that you add to water. Once you add it to water, give it about an hour. Doesn't take any longer than that. And take a small aliquot of that water out and look at it under a, a 10X lens. You should be able to see these nematodes moving around in that solution, right? They're very active. If you don't see that, you need to get in contact with that supplier and tell them that the, you, don't have, you did not receive a shipment of viable nematodes. What's the sense of putting out, paying for and putting out a shipment of a biological control that's dead, right? It's not going to be effective at all. And that is one thing that some of these suppliers have gotten much better at over time is maintaining the viability of that product and shipment. 
Another important thing to do after you use nematodes is irrigate, right? Somehow get a quarter of an inch of water on that lawn to wash those nematodes off of the leaf surface where they're gonna dry and desiccate in the sun and into the soil where they're going to be able to protect themselves from the sunlight and actively seek out hosts. Now on the don'ts side, there are a couple of things that are important as well. So there's this, at least back in the day, there was this tendency for us to treat these like we would a, a synthetic insecticide. So we would pressurize our spray equipment with uh, carbon dioxide. Turns out animals need oxygen to survive. So when we did that, we we're actually asphyxiating these nematodes. And we didn't see very good results as a, as a, a byproduct of that, as you can imagine. We also don't want to use spray pressures any greater than 50 pounds per square inch, right? The high pressure actually kills these nematodes. It's not the pressure itself. It's that once they're pressurized or put under that much pressure, they flow through the, the hoses and to the nozzle. And once they hit that nozzle, all of that pressure is suddenly released and it tends to make the nematodes explode into pieces. So in the early days of research, looking at these nematodes, we we're actually doing both of these things wrong. And we figured it out, but it took a while. So we were spraying dead nematode pieces into the, into the turf environment, somehow expecting them to be affected. You also don't wanna apply nematodes in the full sun. You know, it's great to apply them on a rainy day if you can, or, at sunset and immediately irrigate them in after that application. UV radiation actually kills these nematodes. You also don't wanna mix these the night before and let them sit because they will deplete the, the oxygen supply in the water and asphyxiate themselves. So aside from nematodes, we do have some uh, pretty good microbial products that we can use. Here's a list of them that I've generated. Um, there, uh, there are a couple of these uh, Bacillus thuringiensis products. Um, and Bacillus thuringiensis is obviously a microbial product. It's really the crystalline proteins from a, from a microbe. Um, this strain in particular, sold as Dipel, is effective against caterpillars. And it really does a, a, a quite good job of controlling caterpillars. Um, as long as they're applied, as long as it's applied and uh, um, uh, watered in or watered off the leaf surface. But Dipel is one for, for uh, caterpillars. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis galeriae. This is a relatively new product. Within the last 10 years, it's marketed as a product called Grub Gone. And I think there are some other product names available at this point but this is a white grub specific strain of Bacillus thuringiensis. And so it does provide pretty decent control of most of our white grub species. I wanna say a word about this other microbial product called Painobacillus papillii. You might know it as milky spore. It's a microbial product as well. It's the, the commercially available strains are only effective against Japanese beetles. And quite frankly, I'm just gonna say, don't waste your time with this product. I have never seen in any scientific study that reports that, they, that the product works, All right? I don't know how this product is, is handled and in, 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 uh, prepared in packaging and shipping. Uh, but again, I would stay away from this product simply because I've never seen any good evidence that it's efficacious. Here we have our another nematode, uh, Heteroptitis bacteriophora and Steinonema carpocapsi. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about those, but I want to focus on this other product, Spinosid. This is uh, marketed as conserve or match point. It's another biorational insecticide. It's actually the byproduct of fermentation of these microbes. And it has really excellent caterpillar activity. 
So it would be very good product to use against uh, surface insects like sod webworm, cutworms, and armyworms. Okay, so I want to focus just a little bit on annual white growth because I, I know that people, this is of, of most of the insects that we're worried about. Uh, it tends to be white grubs that we see causing the most damage. These are at the forefront of people's minds. Uh, in particular, our uh, annual white grubs. And our Japanese beetle is a good example of one of those, although there are several other species like mass chafers, European chafers, Asiatic garden beetles, and uh, uh, oriental beetle that also have this same life cycle, right? These insects fly during uh, sort of mid-June to July, depending on where you are. In, in Kansas, it's a, probably a little earlier than that. Um, they fly, if it's Japanese beetle, it's also a pest of a lot of different ornamental plants, as you know. Um, but most of these insects uh, don't really feed as adults, and none of them are pests of turf grass as adults. Instead, they lay their eggs in the soil in turf grass, and then those larvae hatch out of those eggs and develop through three molts, three larval instars, uh, over the course of late summer and into the fall. And it's these later instars, the second and third instars, where we really often see start to see damage mounting, right? By the time they reach this instar, they can consume a lot of plant roots, and they can just mine through the soil and dislodge the roots from the soil as well. As the soil temperatures cool then, those insects go way down in the soil profile to spend the winter. And then they come up in the soil profile again in the spring to do a little bit more feeding before they pupate and emerge again as adults. And there, that means there are basically a few different strategies that we can use to manage them based on the timing we're trying to implement that management strategy. So a preventive strategy is something that we would put in place before we even have larvae in the soil, right? This would be something we might implement on a, on a golf course where we really can't afford to have uh, a lot of damage or on areas where these white grubs are a perennial problem. An early curative approach, on the other hand, targets these early instars with some sort of, a, of an approach that tries to stop them in their tracks before they have the opportunity to move on to become larger, more damaging insects. And then this late curative strategy targets these later instars after damage has started to become apparent, right? So preventive strategy is the insects aren't even there yet. Early curative is the insects are, are there, but they haven't damaged, caused any damage yet. And then late curative is after the damage has start to, started to accumulate and we need to do something quick to get that turf to recover. So in terms of biological insecticides that are, that are available and effective against these insects, I've sort of compiled a bunch of studies that myself and others have done uh, over the last several decades working with these insects. And I have them arranged here and color coded for effectiveness or relative efficacy, depending on timing of application. So with Bacillus thuringiensis galeriae, that uh, grub gone product, we see that really it's most effective if we're targeting those second, those early uh, second and third instars, right? Even late first instars. But if we make this application in this time frame then we're going to get pretty good efficacy. I've seen upwards of 70% efficacy with this product. Yeah, that might not be 100% control like we might expect from some of our chemical and uh, synthetic insecticides, but 70% control is pretty good, right? All we're, we don't have to kill all the insects. We just have to keep them from reaching population densities at which they're likely to damage the turf. And a 70% reduction will often do that, even a 50% reduction. We have this uh, fungal product, Metarusium brunium. It's also marketed as Met52. It's a fungal formulation. And 
we do see fair efficacy out of that product when we're using it to target second and third instars, right here in the later in the summer and even into the early fall. As I mentioned earlier, Panobacillus papillii, this milky spore, I don't have any data indicating that they are actually very effective. So I rate them as poor across the board. Then lastly, our insect parasitic nematodes. Again, the species that we would use against white grubs would be Heterorhabditis bacteriophora. And again, we can see some pretty good efficacy when we're targeting those second and third instars. Now, there are a bunch of synthetic insecticides that we have at our, our uh, fingertips that we can use as tools to manage white grubs. Now, some of these older classes of insecticides, probably not uh, uh, compounds that I would consider sustainable, so to speak, from a, just from a sort uh, an, an environmental standpoint and a safety standpoint, although they, when they're used effectively, they are safe. Um, or when they're used safely, I mean, they are effective, excuse me. So our organophosphates and carbamate insecticides, these are older neurotoxins, right? But they are still available. Our neonicotinoids are some of our best insecticides, but again, we know that they're environmentally persistent. And we also know that they tend to be one of the classes of insecticides that has really been sort of spotlighted as, as a, dangerous for pollinators, right? And that's a big concern when we're thinking about uh, managing lawns and other areas, landscapes, right? These, these compounds tend to get taken up by plants, pushed throughout the plant, including into the blooms of the plant where pollinators are foraging. The class that I wanna point out is sort of what I think of as sort of a low impact class of insecticides are the diamides. And the reason I call, think of them as low impact is that they really don't have much activity at all against humans or other vertebrates, right? The receptors that they target at the neuromuscular junction of insects is something that ma most mammals have very few of. So their, to their toxicity to mammals is very low. It makes them relatively safe compounds to work with and their toxicity profile for pollinators tends to be fairly low as well. Um, I will say that they do have broad spectrum activity. They are some of our best grub control products, but they also are effective against a lot of our caterpillars. So this, if you have to go with a chemical strategy and you wanna maintain, maintain sort of a sustainable program, this is really the class of insecticides that you might consider. It's the safest and it's going to provide you with a pretty good broad spectrum control and long residual activity. Okay, so I covered a lot of, of ground there. I wanna wrap it up here with just a few comments. Um, we do have sustainable management tools and tactics available for turf grass, right? Some of them require substantial investments in time, money, and labor. Thinking about re renovating a stand of turf grass to insect-resistant plants, right? That's going to take some effort, but it's doable, and the investment can often be worth it because it does have a long-term impact. It just simply reduces the likelihood of insect damage for the long term, right? It gives you a good foundation to work from. Some of these products that I've mentioned do require some special handling and application techniques. Thinking about here are the nematodes, for instance, right? We wanna make sure that we don't overpressurize them or pressurize the system with, with carbon dioxide. And we wanna make sure that we don't expose them to sunlight, that we get them watered in pretty quickly. So they are a little more expensive, right? But they can be very effective so that's the trade-off, right? We see that some of these, these sustainable approaches tend to be more expensive, but they also tend to be more durable, right? 
it's something that once you've changed the way you manage these, these turf grasses by implementing host plant resistance or using some of these biological controls, they will persist over time, right? Making it less likely that you'll see an insect population in the future because they're there to regulate those populations over several years. So my advice to you when you're doing, when you're trying to implement what you, one of these sustainable programs is to do your research. The literature is out there. Use the extension service, right? Every state has extension materials, right? Those are vetted materials. They are drawing from the scientific literature and they're compiling this information in a, uh, based on the science that's backing it. It's not purely a marketing driven scheme. Right. So do your research and go to reputable sources for your information. And lastly, remember that timing is important, right? Especially when we're thinking about using some of these biologicals, we want to match the timing of application with the life stage of the insect that's, that we're interested in controlling, right? And making sure that we're putting that application on when it's most vulnerable. And that gives that, that gives that biological control or biorational control an opportunity to do its job. So I'll stop there. I want to plug just a couple things here. I, I do have a, I am active on social media. I have a social media, uh, a Twitter account. Uh, my handle is at Dr. D Rich. Um, I basically use that account to push out timely observations, things I'm seeing going on in the field and direct you to resources, uh, mostly out of my laboratory, but others as well that will help you make effective pest management decisions. I promise I'm not gonna be tweeting pictures of my dinner or anything like that. Um, and then also we do have our Purdue Turf and Landscape Field Day coming up here in, in July of, of uh, July 18th. That's at the uh, WH Daniel Turfgrass Research and Diagnostic Center. We get about 500 people coming to that event every year, and you'll get to see all of the current research that's going on at Purdue in the field of turf grass science, including entomology, pathology, and lots of good agronomy. So if you're interested in visiting my program for uh, any of the information that I talked about today, you can scan this QR code. It's going to take you to all of the educational project uh, products that I have available, fact sheets, bulletins, and, and other materials. Um, and you can, those are free. So feel free to visit that link using this QR code. All right. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Richmond. Really appreciate your presentation. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat or the Q&A section. I do have a couple questions for you. Um, actually, we, we had a couple questions come in before this webinar about uh, moles. And moles are other, um, other mammals that uh, go digging in the soil. Are they an indicator that you have an insect infestation? And if they are, um, are there ways to detract moles from those grub infestations or anything like that? Okay, that's a great question. It's a pretty common question. I get that question all the time. So let me, uh, let me give you the straightforward answer. And that is mole, the main food source for moles is earthworms. All right. So moles in your lawns usually means you have earthworms in your lawn, right? They will eat insects, of course, especially white grubs. They're not gonna pass that up, but um, it's, not an it's not a good indicator or a reliable indicator at all for an inf insect infestation. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about one of your products and that's a Celeprin. When is uh, that you mentioned, one of the products that you mentioned, sorry. Uh, when is the most effective time to apply a Celeprin? So, I recommend that, so if you're targeting white grubs with a celebrin, I recommend that mid-July timing. All of my data indicates that that is the most, I see the highest efficacy 
at that time of ap application, at least in this part of the country. So you're putting it down about the time those uh, eggs are hatching and those first instars are in the soil. And then it will persist into the fall. And several of you may remember a few, couple of years ago, a fall army worm outbreak we had in this part of the country. And lawns that were treated with, with celeprin didn't suffer from that fall arm worm outbreak because a celeprin also hangs in there long enough and provides good caterpillar control. I don't recommend putting it on any earlier than that unless you absolutely have to from an operational standpoint. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk about uh, impacts of climate change on tariff grass insects and tariff grass insect management? Sure, I have a couple of sort of key points that I can make about that. So one of the things that we have talked about for years in terms of managing insects is multiple targeting, right? If we're gonna be using insecticides and insecticidal products, why not make sure that we make that application in a way that hits more than in one insect at a time, and that is, it reduces the amount of insecticide that we're putting into the environment. If we make the right choice of the right insecticide and put it out at the right time to hit, say, our key pests like white grubs and bill bugs, right? At the same time, instead of putting an application out for bill bugs and then following it up with another application for white grubs. Well, the, the climate's changing, it's obvious. And what we're seeing here, at least in the Midwest, is that our rainfall is coming instead of half inch here, a half inch there, an inch here, an inch there, it tends to be coming in these downpours. So we're getting more rainfall than we used to in the past compared to say pre-1970s time, but we're getting it in these deluges. And those deluges are punctuated with two, three, four weeks of drought. So one of the things that I think <clears throat> I'd like to warn people against is making applications preventively, right? Because if you make that application and within 24 hours, you get, an, you get four inches of rain, a downpour, where do you think that application is going to end up? I almost guarantee you that it's not going to stay where you put it, right? So climate change has an impact on our strategies and how we use the, the, the tools that we have. It also means that we're seeing expansions in the range of different pest insects, right? We, had, we, just, we just went through an incredibly mild winter, right? So we're having a longer growing season and that, and that is giving opportunities for pests to persist longer their damage accumulates and new pests are moving into areas that uh, we never found them in before. So range expansions, longer growing seasons, it's just tougher to manage turf under those conditions. Great, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question. You, you talked about um, a celeprin and it having minimal impact on pollinators. Is that for all pollinators or um, because we know that there's some native bees, of course, like mason bees, or maybe not mason bees, but uh, that burrow in the ground. Um, yeah. Are they not affected by these chemicals? Do you know that? So that's an excellent question. Here's what I will say, because you are absolutely right. Most of the testing done with these, these insecticides focuses on honeybees as a model, right? We never look at, the EPA doesn't require registrants to look at, you know, ground nesting uh, uh, sweat bees and other bees that make up the majority of our bees. So fortunately for that product itself, it has very low contact activity, right? It has to be ingested. So unless the bees are ingesting the material, the risk associated with that pro product is pretty low for ground nesting bees. And we've seen the same even for the neonicotinoids, surprisingly enough. 
Great. Thank you. Um, looking at we have uh, any questions in the chat. Um, I'm all wonder wondering for the different turf grass with the end of fights. Um, do they handle so obviously they handle pest pressure pretty well, but do they handle other things like wear well or uh, drought well? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So it just so happens that these endophytes, I talk about them in terms of the benefits they pro provide in terms of insect resistance, but they also provide drought resistance. They allow the plants to persist better in, no, in low nutrient situations. And um, they also have been shown to provide some disease resistance. So I know it sounds like uh, you know, sort of pie in the sky, but actually these benefits, these endophytes benefit the plants on a number of, of fronts. Yeah. Right. And then uh, also staying on endophytes. So obviously we have turf grass brands that have the endophytes in it. Are there, I'm interested, are there like products that you can add to the soil that would add endophytes or is that not a option? Yeah. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, no. Um, so the only way these plants uh, get this endophyte is it's passed on maternally through the seed. So it's not contagious. It can't be taken up. It, do it doesn't spread. It's just uh, the seed that you get has viable endophyte in it or it doesn't. And then those plants will pass it on only through the seed. Yeah. And then uh, my final question is are there any emerging insects that maybe you didn't talk about or maybe that you want to talk about a little bit more from your presentation that we should keep a track of? Well, I, I mean, I did just see a, uh, a report for a, a flea beetle species out west that has, is relatively new, uh, that has been found causing problems in golf course turf. Um, we fortunately right now it's pretty localized, uh, but who knows what that's gonna look like in the future, especially if it decides to expand its range. Um, I think fall army worm, even though it's an old problem and it's one that we know how to deal with, I think it takes people by surprise. And with the relative increase in the frequency of tropical storms, which actually push that insect into this part of the country, um, I can, ex I'll expect to see a, a, maybe an uptick in the, in the occurrence of that insect in the uh, late summer and fall. Um, and then also one thing I didn't mention with, with, uh, with this sort of trying to build these climate resilient turf systems, a lot of people are starting to plant warm season grasses further north, right? So for instance, Purdue's football stadium is uh, Bermuda grass, right? Which surprises a lot of people. It surprised me when they switched to it. But along with that comes insects that weren't previously here, opportunities for them, like hunting billbug is now well established in this part of the state, right? And we never saw it before. We only saw another species of, of billbug, the bluegrass billbug. So those are the three to come to mind. Um, that flea beetle, um, the fall army worm and, uh, hunting bill bug. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you. And I'm just gonna, that's all the questions that we have today. I just wanted to, some last housekeeping stuff for everybody is we do have, um, sorry, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, we do have some upcoming webinars but if first if you want to report for ceus just a brief reminder please email lorelei her contact information is there and it's feasible for florida kansas indiana ohio and michigan so please do email and then uh one more reminder next week we have an epa rodenticide webinar um that we hope that you can join us for um we think it'll be a very educational one and uh, 
everybody will be receiving a post survey. Um, please do respond to that. We we really value your input, and it also helps us come up with uh, new sessions for future future webinars. So thank you for your time, Dr. Richmond. We really appreciate it. Um, and I will we'll be in touch with everybody else soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.